Ed and Erica Leak have been residents of Burlington Township since 2004. They have three daughters, Peyton, a 2014 graduate of Burlington Township High School, a rising BTHS senior, and Quinn, a rising BTHS sophomore. As a residents of their community, they have supported and encouraged their daughters in cheerleading, soccer, theater, marching band, Girl Scouts, basketball, and other community and school related events. You guys are busy. In recent months, they have been engaged in leading crucial conversations with other individuals on strategies to fight racism in our society. Ed and Erica, why did you agree to participate in this conversation and what do you hope to accomplish and gain from this session? Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good, good. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here on this call uh, with our Burlington Township uh, peeps. Uh, we're joining here just to be a part of the solution. You know, one of the things that we like about Berlin, love about Burlington Township is the diversity, uh, the diversity of the community. Um, and so, as you mentioned, we have three daughters who have we've, ra we've raised, you know, in Burlington Township. And so they they've experienced that diversity. But I think this is the first time they've really faced adversity in the midst of that diversity. Uh, and so we're really here to, to be a part of the solution, um, to model the behaviors and the conversations that we want our daughters to have, and um, also to get help, get insight, you know, because this is, this is, this is tough. You know, we, we're trying to coach them through um, how to manage those social media accounts and how to respond to people and how to engage people without anger, without hostility. Uh, but sometimes you do feel anger. Sometimes you do feel hostility, um, and that's okay too. So we're we're a part of this because we want to be a part of the solution, and we want to try to um, learn how to better navigate and help our help our daughters uh, better navigate this 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 time that we're in um, and reconcile. Um, I echo everything that Ed said. Uh, I very strongly believe that um, our strength lies in our differences. And so I just believe that, you know, Burlington Township, you know, just is a, it already is a really strong community. And I just think we can get, become even stronger and even better, you know, if we just really learn to capitalize on the diversity and um, just the amazing, um, wonderful, you know, just sort of variety of um, cultures and, and backgrounds that exist in this community. I also think that children follow what their parents do. And if I value it, my kids will as well. And so um, that is something that's really uh, important to us. Thank you so much. Our next family um, are the Millers. Uh, Bobby Jo Miller grew up in Burlington City and she's been a Burlington Township resident for the past 19 years. Um, Burlington City um, has basically an even ratio of black and white student, students. Um, her husband, Wade, grew up in Tuckerton, New Jersey, and he's been a Burlington Township resident for 19 years as well. Unlike Burlington City, uh, Wade grew up in a much less diverse, yet it never impacted his view on equality and inclusion. Wade and Bobby Joe have two boys. Wade Jr. is 20 and he attended Burlington Township High School and is currently enrolled in Virginia Tech and is entering his junior year for aerospace engineering. Gage is 16 and entering his junior year in Burlington Township and Gage plays football and baseball for the high school. Both Wade and Bobby Joe volunteer often in the community and help families in need in the local area through benefits such as the Holiday Helpers. Bobby, Joe, and Wade, please tell us, why did you agree to participate in this conversation and what do you hope to accomplish and gain from this session? Thanks, Liz. Um, first, we want to start off by just saying how honored we are to be um, chosen. So it's funny because uh, Bobby, Joe, and I were actually out getting dinner one night when, when she had told me that you had reached out uh, to be part of the panel for this discussion. And you know, my first thought, right, was, oh, this is tough. This is not going to be easy. What kind of questions are they going to ask? You know, or is it, am I going to be put on the spot? Um, not so much for her. She's She has no problem. But, um, you know, for me, I'm thinking about, first, the fact that this is a very difficult topic to talk about. And it's something that, um, 
that, you know, when you really reflect on it, that's why it's so important that we talk about it. That's why it's, it's important that we get engaged, that we join with the community together. Um, and we don't be afraid to say something wrong because we're all humans. Um, and it's very important that we, we express, you know, our thoughts, um, and really be here, be here for each other. Me? Um, Liz, thank you for asking us because I, I would love to do this always with everyone. Mine's not going to be as long as his, but I just, I'm here because I want to educate and give my experiences, but I, and most important, I want to be educated. I need, I think that I know everything when it comes to it and that I'm in a good spot. But over the past few months, I've learned so much about so many people, whether it be good, whether it be bad, I my eyes are open and I hear a lot of people. I hear a lot of people. And that's what's important to me is to listen. And I think lastly, uh, Liz, in terms of what we hope to accomplish today, um, it, it's really looking to grow as parents and and making sure that we get comfortable with being uncomfortable on, on talking about racial injustices. Thanks. Thank you. Katina? Thank you. Our next family is the Walker family. Sean and Dr. Dana Walker are 20 year residents of Burlington Township. Dana is a lifelong educator and Sean is an owner operator within the trucking transportation industry. Together, they are raising their two children who now attend Burlington Township High School. Their daughter is a rising senior and their son a rising junior. Both children have been involved in sports, including football, baseball, and volleyball, as well as band, black and gold, peer leadership, student council, and dance. The Walkers are a close-knit core and are intentional in their acts of faith, family, and friendship. Sean and Dana, why did you agree to participate in this conversation, and what do you hope to accomplish and gain from this session? Thank you, Ms. George. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Good evening, everyone. I may be the self-appointed speaker in the Walker household. So Sean is here, as you can see. You may or may not hear him chime in. Uh, levels of vulnerability are, you know, different for each of us. So I am usually the more vocal one in these types of matters, but he will nod or jump in as he feels comfortable. So again, as everyone has said, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, we did have an opportunity to receive the questions in advance. And I think this first question of why participate is really one of the most critical questions for me. Actually being a parent, when one of the letters came out from the superintendent, I think it was shortly after the um, protest, the peaceful protest, it seemed like there was going to be an opportunity for conversations and for a series. So at that time, I emailed the superintendent, assistant superintendent, Liz Scott, as well as the BA, just to raise my hand and say that, you know, I would love to be a part of any forthcoming opportunities to discuss race within Burlington Township. It's an awesome town, um, but it's not a town without faults. And I think sometimes we've taken the easy route of just not saying things or perhaps taking the high road or maybe it's the low road when you don't say anything. So I wanted to ensure that during this time that we capitalize on the movement that's going on. And I felt like it was important for me, as someone else said, to be a role model for my children, especially with them being teenagers and one of them sitting on the stairs and listening right now. It starts with me. It starts with my husband. So. I think it's important that they see us step out of our comfort zone. It's not just having the conversations with them and with our family members and with our close circle, but to also put ourselves out there and to be a resource as well as to be open to learn. So, you know, what are some of our neighbors saying? What are the other four families going to respond to? How many similarities and differences might we have as we answer these questions? because our children are being raised in the same district, sometimes in the same classrooms. And it's critical that we really understand the point of view of all of the residents to the best of our ability, 
to help navigate their livelihood and how they interact and grow as human beings. So we hope to, you know, just learn and to uh, be a resource and um, thank you for this opportunity. Good evening, everybody. Um, I would just like to say that you couldn't pay me enough money right now to be a teenager in today's society. They have a rough job. I mean, and they just, in some situations, they just don't know how to deal and how to cope. And sometimes they, it's so easy to turn the wrong in the wrong direction. So hopefully from this right here, we can gain some insight and help each other to help our kids, not your kids, our kids. So thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Walker family. Our next family is the Sherman family. Carolyn and Michael Sherman have lived in Township for 10 years and they have three sons. Um, Aiden's a 12th grader, Brady is a sixth grader and Carter is a fourth grader. Carolyn has been a high school health and phys ed teacher and coach at Freehold Regional High School. And she started a club at her school called Lead for Diversity several years ago. This club brings students from different racial, gender, sexual orientation and social economic backgrounds together to help them understand how their different life experiences can help bring them closer together through education. Michael has been a Hopewell Township police officer for 21 years and has started programs in his department such as National Night Out, Coffee with the Cop, and the Adopt a Cop program to help bridge the gap between the community and the police department. Michael has been recognized as a volunteer of the year by his municipal alliance and voted officer of the year twice by his peers. Both Carolyn and Michael have been visible on the sidelines of their children's sporting events in Burlington Township and they've also coached. Most importantly, Carolyn and Michael believe that they teach young athletes in a way that will translate into them being better young adults as they grow. In a diverse community such as Burlington Township, Carolyn and Michael believe that they have a unique perspective on the issue of race. However, for the Sherman family, racial inequality has been experienced both personally and professionally. The Sherman family believes this guided discussion is a step in the right direction and grateful to live in a community where these conversations are welcomed and encouraged. So Carolyn and Michael, why did you agree and say yes to be a participant? And what do you hope to gain and accomplish from these sessions? Oh, sorry, we're trying to get our microphone unmuted here. <laughs> Um, first, we, we want to say thank you for having us um, to Mrs. Scott, Mrs. Bell, um, and the community itself. This is, uh, this is a very important and we know uncomfortable conversation, um, but we believe that obviously just looking at the panel, the uh, different families that are here, we all come from different walks of life and have different experiences. And, you know, this, this panel, this discussion allows us to start a maybe to heal and b to to grow as a community grow as families and grow as individuals as well um, but we agreed because we know that the problem of of racism and inequality uh is in fact real in today's society i think uh you know it it comes and goes where you know one person is is uh is, we see something on tv and there's an uproar for a week or two, and then it goes away. Then the next year it happens again. We need we need this to continue. We need to be able to speak about it. It can't just be when when we see a video uh, of something that is inhumane. These these things happen every single day, and we need to to continue to have have these conversations to make sure that we don't lose one more person in our, in our community. Um, we're fortunate to live in a town that is diverse um, and that these that these communications are happening on a regular. Um, what I can say is I work in a predominantly white town where I, I don't think these conversations can happen. And, um, you know, the, the reason we did agree, Carol and I come from two different backgrounds. I'm, I come from a uh, interracial family. She comes from an area that's that was a all white township. 
but obviously we came together. We have a family of biracial kids and uh, we have that unique perspective that we can talk about race openly. And unfortunately, we've had to have some some conversations a little earlier than we thought we would have to at this point, but uh, it's also a blessing in disguise as well because it has opened a dialogue between our family internally here at our house and also um, you know, with other family members. And we've learned some things about some people in our family that kind of surprise us a little bit as well. So, you know, good and bad. So we hope uh, to keep the dialogue going, obviously, but we also hope that some change happens as well, you know, here in our community and throughout the country as well. Okay, I'm going, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to introduce our next panelist and keynote speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Shanique Massey-Lambert. She is a national trainer at Eye-Opening Enterprises. She is one of our valued Rutgers University partners, and I have felt very lucky to be able to work with Shanique and Kelly this year um, since I've been here. She has a doctorate in clinical psychology and currently serves as a senior training and consultation specialist for the Children's Center for Resilience and Trauma Recovery at SAMHSA-funded Category 3 Trauma Services Training Center. Dr. Massey Lambert assists in coordination of provisions of highly specialized training, consultation, and capacity building for New Jersey mental health providers and other professionals serving children from underserved populations. She is also responsible for providing ARC and ARC GROW training and ongoing consultation across Rutgers departments and within New Jersey's Children's System of Care Provider Registry. Dr. Massey Lambert provides training and consultation in Question, Persuade, and Refer, which is also known as QPR, Youth Suicide Prevention Program, as well as Youth Mental Health First Aid to law enforcement, faith leaders, and school personnel in the Burlington County area. Her clinical Interests include working with individuals across a lifespan in the areas of trauma, relational issues, and cultural identity concern. Dr. Massey Lambert will talk with us tonight about race-based trauma and radical healing. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to work with um, Burlington Township and with the families who are here as well. Um, I guess I'll start by answering those same questions, um, why I agreed to participate and what I hope to get out of the evening. Um, I agreed to participate because when we talk about issues of racism and, and social injustice, I really feel that um, so many parts of my identity are potentially at risk and under attack. Um, my identity as a Black woman, as a mother to a Black son, um, having a Black husband and father, all of those things feel um, threatened when I think about what we have been seeing in recent months. So um, for me, the stakes are way too high not to respond and not to do something in my little corner <laughs> of the world um, to talk about these issues and hopefully educate folks. You know, um, I believe that we fear things that we don't understand. So the more I can spread information and normalize things and um, just really try to educate folks, I hope that that creates a sense of safety. Um, what I hope to get out of this evening is to learn from the other panelists and also from the audience. Um, but I also hope that this conversation uh, increases safety so that we can continue to have these talks. Okay. So should I jump in or? Okay. All right. So I just wanted to mention that um, this evening I am joined by our program director, Dr. Kelly Moore. However, this evening she's working behind the scenes um, and handling some technology stuff for us. So you won't see or hear from her, but she may manage the chat and respond to any of your concerns or reactions. Um, Katina did a wonderful job of telling you about our center. Um, I'll just share that it's really um, my passion and Dr. Kelly Moore's passion to work with folks across all disciplines, all walks of life and spread mental health awareness. Uh, our thinking is that knowledge really is empowering and the more we know, the more likely we are um, to take action and really create safe spaces for our young people. So I'll dive in. Um, our goal for today's discussion, it's really ambitious for the short amount of time we have, but I'm gonna try my best to get us there. Um, we really want to start to think about the current events in the context of racial trauma, um, because that's what we're, we're all kind of going through uh, as a collective. We want to go over some strategies that parents and allies can start to implement to support their children um, and create safer spaces within the community. 
And then lastly, we want to talk about resilience and healing. Um, in our profession, we believe it's extremely powerful to name our experiences and explore the impact. But it's equally important to think about what next, you know, what do we do with the things um, that that we've experienced and now that we know what we feel and what we've seen, how do we handle that and grow and move forward. So the first thing I want to do is name the experience. I think it's really important for us to really think about what racism is, um, why it makes folks uncomfortable uh, and to just explore that. We have to name that experience in order to move any further. Um, racism is the thinking that um, specific groups have some innate characteristics or um, abilities, inferiority or superiority solely based on the group that they belong to racially or ethnically. Um, and, and I like to think that the definition of racism is best defined as the combination of discrimination and power. Um, we all have blind spots, every single one of us. We all have blind spots. We all have maybe some discriminatory thinking or belief in stereotypes. But what makes racism dangerous is that there's the combination with power. When you're able to impact the livelihoods or um, just impact the others around you because you have that combination of discrimination and power is where we really start to worry. Um, so there are several forms of racism, and I think we've seen a little bit of all of these in recent months, given the pandemic and uh, the social injustices, but there's individual or personal racism that can be someone just holding thoughts or uh, about certain things, or it can be um, internalized racism. A colleague of ours named uh, Dr. Dana Crawford talks about the idea that racism is in the air. Um, it's all around us. It's like pollution. It's around us even when we don't want it to be. It can kind of creep into our bodies and um, can cause us to feel uncomfortable, cause us to feel ill. Um, it, it's there. And um, unfortunately, sometimes it does creep into our thinking and the way that we feel about ourselves and feel about others. So often we see internalized racism show up in um, things people do to themselves to try to alter their appearance and things like that. Uh, there's also interpersonal racism, which is obviously an exchange between, um, you know, one person to another. Um, there is cultural racism, where there's the belief that, um, well, it's not based on your race. It's based on the way that we live. Our cultures and our cultural practices are so different that we just can't coexist. I can't live freely and practice how I want to in the same space as this other person. Um, that's the cultural racism. And then there's institutional and structural racism. Um, institutional racism is essentially the failure of a system to be able to provide um, appropriate professional services to a person solely based on their belonging to a specific racial group. Um, and when I say a professional service, I'm not talking about, you know, like a cleaning or something like that. I mean, um, education, um, access to health care, you know, appropriate health care. Um, support and representation in our judicial system. These are the institutions where we see some of this stuff show up. And then structural or systemic racism is the idea that um, these institutions functioning together can create certain outcomes, adverse impact for particular groups because of their belonging to that racial group. So we know if there's been adverse impact if um, specific groups are likely to experience power inequities, um, if they're likely to experience difficulty with accessing um, housing, um, health care, um, poverty, these are the things that show us that there's some structural deep seated stuff going on. Um, so earlier in the, in the chat box, I did ask the participants to share what their emotional reactions have been to some of these um, social injustices, seeing the murders of um, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And I received some responses both publicly and privately. And um, some of the things that came up were feeling um, overwhelmed, feeling violated, feeling angered, feeling overwhelmed. And I think it makes sense because racism is interpersonal violence. It's overwhelming. It removes our control and our power, um, our ability to navigate and feel safe and be able to kind of predict things. And, um, be future oriented and feel hopeful about what's coming next. There's a pretty heavy quote here um, from Kenneth Hardy, but it says that racial oppression is a traumatic form of interpersonal violence, which can impact the spirit. It can impact the soul and it can impact our psyche, our thinking and our ability to function. Um, and all of that is true.
So when we think about the responses, remember the responses that I received were that um, folks felt overwhelmed, they felt angered, they felt um, worried about their lives and the lives of people they loved. It makes sense then that we see racism um, as a traumatic exposure. The diagnostic manual that mental health professionals use to diagnose PTSD and other things um, indicates that in order for an event to be considered traumatic, there has to be exposure um, or, or threatened exposure to death, serious injury, violence, or violation. And again, all of that kind of falls under what we have been seeing and experiencing over the past few months. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, who funds us, um, also came up with a set of guidelines to help us understand how a person has been impacted by certain events. They indicate that there should be three E's. First, there has to be an event. I think we can all agree that there have been several events in the past few months that could be potentially concerning. So that's one check. Um, then we have to pay attention to the way that the person experienced that event. What we know is that trauma is extremely subjective and uh, developmentally bound. That means is that two people can be observing the same events and have very different responses to it, um, very different ways of perceiving it. So it's important for us to hear from the person themselves. How did they experience it? What emotions were awakened for them? Um, and then the last piece is effects. How have they been impacted? Has their functioning been impacted in some way? Um, are they struggling with managing and making relationships? Has there been any, any changes in the way that they function? And if the answer is, to that, is yes to that, then we have three checks. We have something that is potentially traumatic. Um, often when we're working with folks and they come in and they wanna share some experience that they've had, they'll ask us, well, is, does this count as a traumatic experience? And the answer is always, if you think it does, then it does. Okay, so we really want to hear from folks um, and focus more on the impact that they've, that they've had um, in order to understand if it was traumatic for them or not. So the type of trauma responses, this is what we consider um, either trauma responses or race-based traumatic stress responses. Um, usually, if we want to see if our young person has been impacted in any way, we want to focus on these three areas. We want to start with behavior. The reason why we focus on behavior, especially in young people, is because um, developmentally, they're not often in a place where they're able to express what they're feeling. Um, maybe they're not connected to what they, they're feeling. Maybe in an effort to kind of stay safe, they've disconnected emotionally. So we want to focus on that. Are they struggling with identifying, having emotional language? Are they struggling, I'm sorry, are they struggling to show us what's going on? Um, usually when words fail, behaviors show up in a big way with our young folks. So have they done anything that's really different? Have they started to isolate? Have they started to act out? Um, and the same goes for emotional responses as well. Are they having a difficult time managing the emotions? Can they calm themselves down? Often parents will tell me, I don't know why, but it seems like lately it's just really hard to console my child, to kind of get them back to their baseline and who I know them to be. Um, so any subtle shifts in the behavioral responses to things or emotional responses warrant some additional attention and conversation. Um, lastly, there's the cognitive piece. So what we know is that there are a ton of changes that take place in the brain um, after being exposed to trauma, especially if there um, are multiple traumas and there's uh, exposure to a great deal of trauma over a, a longer length of time. There can be shifts in the way that we think, the way that we think about ourselves. Um, sometimes we see children become um, a little more down on themselves, not feeling so hopeful, not really being future oriented, not feeling great about themselves. Um, we see their perception of others in the world shifting as well to being really, um, really kind of gloom and doom, really believing that the world is this big, bad, scary place and people are inherently out to get them. If we see those shifts, we definitely want to have some conversation around it. Um, additionally, since we're heading back to school soon, I feel the need to mention that there can be shifts in academic performance as well. Um, maybe our children are, because of the exposure, they may appear to be less attentive, um, struggle to follow through with instructions, um, really just, um, can't really focus. And, and the reason why is because if a young person has been through a great deal of adversity or there's something that came and kind of turned things upside down for them, they are now focused on survival. 
they are now scanning their environments constantly um, and anticipating threat, even when the threat does not exist. So all of their resources are really channeled towards survival. And so they're kind of giving, you know, they're kind of losing an opportunity to focus in on academic pursuits. So again, um, I don't want to over pathologize any of this. So if you see any of this stuff in isolation or combination, it just warrants some additional attention and a sit down and a conversation. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have absolutely been exposed to something traumatic. So we've kind of named the experience and talk, talked about what some of the signs and symptoms are. Um, now I want to talk about what we do with all of that. And I want to start with allies and accomplices, and then we'll work our way to parents. So if you, if you do not identify as Indigenous, as Black, or a person of color, then you may be an ally or an, or an accomplice. Um, and the first step, the first thing you can do to ensure or create safety um, is don't pretend like nothing is happening. We absolutely have to have difficult conversations. It is important to approach your children about these issues, even if they don't mention it to you. Um, because I can tell you, uh, my, my son's only almost three, but I have friends who have children who have cell phones and they watch the videos of these murders. They watch the videos of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and then told their parents, I saw this. The parents were overwhelmed and did not know what to do with that. And my answer was sit down and talk and keep talking. Um, so we have to bring it to our young folks and have these conversations. Um, you also want to be a model. You don't want to give the impression that you are colluding with racism, that you are okaying it in any way. So what that means is that we have to show them what it means to um, call in and call out. Basically, we got to show up and call out, what, call it out when we see things that are not right. Um, the next thing you can do is really just listen with openness um, if anything is shared with you. Uh, what that means is that if someone who um, you are close to shares that they've experienced some racism or discrimination, um, you do not have to understand their experience. You do not have to agree with their perception of the event. Um, but what you should do is honor and listen to what their experience is um, and focus more on how they've been impacted by that particular event. The next thing is show empathy. Um, so it's important to know that Black and Indigenous and people of color during these times are really experiencing a lot of stress and collective grief. Um, it almost feels like a member of our family or several members of our family have been taken too soon. Um, so think about the things that you would do for a person when they are typically stressed or mourning and grief. Um, you know, for someone who's much closer to them, what are the things you would offer that person? And then try to offer them those things now. Um, lastly, is take responsibility for educating yourself. Um, it is great if you have some peers, if you have friends or family members who identify as a person of color and they're okay with um, educating you and answering all of your questions, but sometimes that too can be overwhelming for people of color. So um, seek out opportunities, you know, watch movies, read books, um, attend classes, uh, but kind of take the reins and be responsible for educating yourself. Um, the other uh, thing, so the other thing that we can all do, we'll get to parents soon, but the thing that we can all do as allies and as parents and community members is really support, um, you know, fostering resilience and post-traumatic growth. Resilience is the ability to function in spite of adversity, being able to kind of bounce back and return to um, some level of functioning. And then post-traumatic growth is the idea that following exposure to adversity, there is a possibility that we can develop some strengths in areas where we were previously limited or experienced a weakness. And you can support both of those by having um, developmentally appropriate conversations with young people about the facts of what's happening, um, protecting them by limiting and monitoring their access to news and media, um, encouraging their own self-exploration, uh, encouraging them to help others who may be um, impact more heavily impacted or equally impacted. Um, and then also modeling for them what it looks like to manage emotions, uh, teaching them self-care and participating in self-care together. These are just a few examples of the things that you can do to really foster resilience. Um, you know, hearing from them and letting them um, tell you how they think they want to problem solve having some of that agency to think about how to move forward is great as well. Um, and then there's radical healing. I love the concept of radical healing. 
it is different from traditional healing. Traditional healing really focuses on the individual working on themselves and learning how to tolerate or, or cope with um, the environments around them. But radical healing says that we heal by changing not just us, what's inside, but what's outside also. Kind of changing our environment so that it feels safer. Um, so it's, it's almost like a corrective experience that I'm healing by making my environment more celebratory of who I am. Um, so it's really about becoming whole in the face of, you know, identity based wounds, things that you've experienced solely because of the groups that you might belong to or identify with. Um, all of us can support radical healing um, by teaching young people about their culture um, so that they learn more, they feel more connected, maybe they even feel a sense of pride. Um, we can encourage them to share their stories of pain and discomfort with people that they trust and feel safe with. Uh, we can also encourage them to hold on to radical hope. You know, there is this thinking that, you know, somehow it's got to get better. We always say this in my family, it, it has to get better, right? Because, and we have to be able to survive and we have to be able to make it through because the folks before us did too. And maybe they did it with fewer resources. So maintaining some of that radical hope and knowing that, you know, my ancestors or, you know, X groups of people were able to get by and make, you know, improvements. Um, so I should be able to do that as well. They can also um, engage in um, some restorative, some self-care and, and um, some self-care stuff that's restorative to the community as well. So it's not, again, not just about um, healing myself, but healing myself and my community at the same time. So maybe the self-care is um, volunteering and doing a community cleanup. This is good because it's physical, it's outdoors, but it also may increase my pride in the community that I live in and you know, other people's pride in the community. Or being able to volunteer as a peer mentor, again, restoring the community and restoring myself. So these are some of the suggestions, just a few, and I'm sure if we spent more time brainstorming, we could come up um, with other ideas about how to do that. So essentially what I'm encouraging you all do is to teach your children how to heal out loud. Um, Race-based wounds tend to be very loud, very public, very painful. So we need to teach our young people um, how to heal out loud as well. They don't have to sink, kind of shrink away and, and do this on their own. Um, in the elementary school age, you can encourage that by having conversations early on, encouraging questions very early on. Research shows us that by the age of three, children are already starting to separate in the classroom and play according to race, where they identify. So if they can see these differences and start to separate themselves, they can have some age appropriate conversations around culture and race. Um, you can also do that by identifying avenues for creative expression. So that may be journaling about different cultures, painting, writing, whatever it may be, thinking of fun and creative ways. Dance is usually a really cool way. Dance and singing, if you kind of explore different songs from different cultures or different dances. Uh, you can also engage your family in a family book club where maybe once a month or every other month you pick a book and you all read it together. Uh, and then by the end of the month, you sit down and have some conversation, you go over the questions, you go over the highlights, um, but you can pick a book that focuses every other month on different cultures and different religions and things like that. Next, I think in the elementary school age um, range, it's a great idea to praise upstander behavior. Um, if your child is in that elementary or high school age range, then you know that this language is really common around bullying. Um, upstander versus bystander, and acts of discrimination and racism are bullying, bullying behavior. So we want to teach our children not to be the bystander who stands by and maybe doesn't say anything for a lot of different reasons. Some of them good. Maybe they're fearful about becoming a target, or maybe um, they're just not sure what to say. But instead, we want to encourage them to be the upstander, the person who says, hey, don't do that. That's not right. Or gets an adult, a trusted adult, to intervene and set things right. And then lastly, for that age range, you can look at increasing safety by creating awareness. Maybe you encourage your child when they have certain school projects that they bring a cultural twist to it so that they have an opportunity to raise awareness. Um, or maybe you as the caregiver bring, you know, come to the school with plenty of ideas and you want to do some cultural events at the school. All of these things can be helpful. In that high school age range, uh, you can do things like intergenerational storytelling. 
Um, you can talk about, you can bring folks from different age groups into the room and have them share their respective experiences and how they got through those tough times. Uh, you can do advocacy walks and rallies. We saw some great efforts initi initiated by high school students in the past few months, and I am in awe by their courage and commitment. Um, you can highlight and celebrate social justice heroes so that they, one, get to know their history, but also get to know who are the folks who are kind of on the front lines and doing this work day in and day out. Uh, community engagement and volunteer work is really helpful, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So it could be mentorship, community cleanups, it could be cultural events, um, or they can also engage in some type of performing arts that are connected to other cultures. All right, so I know I mentioned a lot of things in a short amount of time, um, but I want to leave you with this as we we're going to engage in some um, panel discussion. But before we leave today, I want you to reflect on everything. Um, I want you to reflect on the past five months. I want you to reflect on this conversation and the questions that come. I want you to explore what you feel. What do you feel in response to these things that you've heard? Uh, what do you think you need based on what you feel? And then what are you going to do about those things? Um, I forgot to mention part of my participating in this is that I'm an active healer. So when I feel impacted in order to cope, I have to do something. So this is my something. Um, so think about what are the things you can do um, to recover, to move forward, to create environments that are not only safe, but welcoming and celebratory of all of who we are. Thank you. Shanique, thank you so much. That was that was powerful. And um, I'm sitting here thinking about um, what you said as far as moving forward. And and I have to say, um, for me, um, I I have been feeling, and I still do feel, a sense of sadness, a sense of hurt, a sense of pain. Um, I would even go as far as to say that there's a, a sense of depression with all of this that's happening, just keeping it real. But at the same time, um, I am feeling hope and hope in terms of things seem different with what's happening now. And just from the last conversation we had that involved our students, it was just, um, it was uplifting and it gave me a sense of um, pride, a strong sense of hope in seeing what our young people are doing. But it, it, it does hurt, and I've, I've said this over and over again, being the mother of three black boys, is it's hard. Um, we're in the process of, of sending um, our oldest one, they're actually going back to campus, and the anxiety and the agita of, between COVID and, and the racial things that are going on um, on his campus and just in the world, it, it petrifies me, to be very honest. And then the other son, their college decided all remote. So yes, I'm happy. I have one, that's one I don't have to worry about. But um, I need us to continue this. I need to have a sense of purpose. Um, and I need to hold on to that sense of hope. And in that, um, I will continue to, to do this work. I will continue to try to bring more people on board to um, just grow this, 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 uh, this venture. So um, on behalf of us, we just want to say thank you for your insight and for everything that, that you shared with us um, this evening. So thank you. So let's engage in some conversations. We, we've heard what Shanique has said, um, and I want our panelists to chime in and, and talk about um, how what has been happening. How has it impacted you? How has it impacted your family, your children, your relationships? Whoever wants to chime in, go for it. So I guess we can start. Oh, no. Go ahead, Al. Just paper, scissors, shoot. <laughs> Sorry, Liz, we cut you off. Do you want us to go? Go ahead. Um, yeah, so as I said before, it kind of, 
you know, it forced us to to talk about this with our kids, which which isn't a bad thing. It actually helped open that dialogue. Um, you know, for instance, my son, my oldest, he has his license now. When he had his permit, we were driving down the street. And again, me being a police officer, you know, I've I've experienced certain things myself as well. But I had to have a conversation after uh, you know, the George, George Floyd incident. I had to have a conversation with him about driving with his hooded sweatshirt on when he drove down the street. Now, you know, if if you're not in my shoes, if you're not, un- unfortunately, or, you know, maybe, maybe if you are in my shoes, driving down the street as a, as a black man with a hooded sweatshirt on, I- I'd been pulled over for that myself, believe it or not. And when I asked why I was pulled over, you know, and I identified myself as a police officer, the, the guy told me, trust me, you don't want to know, walk back to his car and drove away. Now, you know, that happened about 10 years ago. That's not that long, long of a, of a time frame. But I had to have that conversation with my son, like, hey, listen, when you're driving down the street, just don't have a, a hooded sweatshirt on or your hoodie up, I should say. And as a parent, that hurt. You know, no one should have, I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, I, I don't care. You shouldn't have to have that conversation with your kid, but it's a reality. And, you know, unless you've experienced that, you don't know how you feel. And like you said, you know, that sense of um, of anxiousness, you know, every time he walks out the door, I'm afraid, you know, what may happen just because of the color of his skin. And We have, you know, two other younger kids. And, you know, if you've ever seen my younger two sons, unfortunately, we know a reality is going to be that they're going to have two different life experiences. My youngest is a a little darker skin than my middle son. And, you know, I know that it's a reality that they're going to have different life experience just on the color of of their skin if they're not standing next to each other. And, you know, we have been able to talk to them and we've been able to go to these rallies. We've organized rallies. And, you know, for us, that has, has taken some of that burden of having to sit them down because we said, you know what, actions sometimes speak louder than words and let's go out and let's see what other people have to say as well. You know, cause everyone knows sometimes kids don't want to listen to their own parents. So, you know what, let's go listen to see what other people are saying. Let's hear some other experiences. And we're fortunate here in Burlington Township um, that the rallies that were scheduled by these young women from the the high school, they were, there were great attendance uh, numbers. And, you know, some of the the experience that people shared, they're very heartfelt. They're very eye-opening of what's happening, even in our own community. So the, the good thing is it's impacted us in a way that yes, we're angry, but on the other hand, it's allowed us to open that dialogue with our own kids and with our own family. Yeah, I, I jump in and share. I um, I think like most of us, we it's kind of a mixed bag of emer- emotions. Um, first emotion is is anger and frustration. You know, it's like. You know, how many times do we have to get beat down, hit before you realize it hurts? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so when you hear about all these incidents and you see all these these different incident, incidents, it's just frustrating and it's it's annoying and it's it's um sometimes demoralizing, you know, because I've been rallying and protesting since I was a teenager. Um uh, and I'm hitting up 150, <laughs> you know, we're still having a lot of the same issues. But um uh, but like Liz said, I'm also cautiously optimistic. Uh, this does feel a little different um, in terms of, I remember having some conversations with um, some of my coworkers back when the Trayvon Martin incident happened and how I had one conversation with, good, with a good friend of mine, Tony, you know, white guy, we were buddies, we hung out, you know, stayed at each other's house, just, 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 just good friend, but we, we were different. We had different, different life experiences. And so he was just like, well, I don't understand why you, why you just don't get a white, why are you so upset? And, and when um, doctor was kind of presenting and she kind of talked about empathy and, and talked about um, not telling, dismissing somebody's feelings, 
I, I thought about that because when I was talking to Tony, I was I was like, listen, he had a son, George. I said, what if your son, George, went down the street to, to Wawa, I got a soda and a bag of Skittles. And as he was walking home, you know, somebody, some strange guy walked up to him, harassed him, you know, started an altercation with him and then shot him and killed him. How would you feel? And his response to me, well, well that's different. And I'm like, how is it different? Uh, and the difference was he didn't see Trayvon as his son. You know what I mean? And so that was the difference. He didn't recognize, he didn't see Trayvon the way I saw Trayvon, which was a younger version of me. He just saw him as some, I guess, some dude. Um, and that's just how he felt. Uh, but the good thing is that we had the conversation and we, and we had more conversations after that. Um, what I'm seeing now with the George Floyd and the recent incidents is it's not I'm not hearing that. Why don't you just get over it as much? Why? Why is it such a big deal? I'm hearing a little bit more. I get it. I see why you're so frustrated. I see why you're so upset. Um, so that's kind of a first step, which is good. And now we just have to kind of take that momentum and, and, and keep it keep it going forward. So I'll go if that's OK. Yeah. So I'm going to piggyback off the Sherman and Leak family. Um, I wrote down something the other day. Actually, I heard something the other day, and it was, this is nothing new. The response is new. So this has been going on for so long, but the response is different. It's new. And to piggyback off of the Lee Sherman family, um, we as white parents when my kids go out the door me as a white mom saying to my white sons all right guys you got everything you have your money you have your keys be careful five minute conversation if that they're out the door a black mom has a conversation and says you have your keys you have your money all right be careful if you get stopped by the cops, you keep your hands on that steering wheel and you make sure that you don't move until that cop comes. And if you're walking down the street and you have a hoodie on, please take your hoodie off for me, please, please. It's a half hour conversation. It's so different as white, I'm gonna say moms and I know it's parents, but as a white mom letting my kids go out the door, it's so much different than a black mom letting her kids go out the door. And I know that and I feel that. And then when you said with Trayvon Martin, I felt it, he felt it. Like he wasn't just some black kid walking down the street. We felt it. And I don't know if it's cause we have two sons that we felt it or we just felt it because we know. Hi, I'll just piggyback behind Bobby Joe. So the conversation, you're right, is very different. And the conversation is new, but in the end, it really isn't anything new for um, the reality that we live in being African-Americans in a diverse state, albeit, you know, what New Jersey is. So this conversation has been happening since my children were, since they could understand. They have to know the language. They have to understand the consequences because the consequences are dire. And it's a little bit different now because our children are seeing it and I guess social media and being a part of it. And as somebody else said, they don't necessarily want to hear it from their parents. So I probably have had this conversation from the time, just from the time that they're not holding your hand walking down the street anymore. But the difference is now you see it on social media and you see it on television and all the news stations are covering it. And it is difficult for a child. Our children are friends, um, the Millers and the Walkers. So they will be in the same group but the conversation and what could potentially happen, unfortunately, is totally different. And for a teenage boy, he doesn't get why it's different. You all know he's a great kid. And if you don't have that relationship, he's just another black boy. He's just another kid. So they're just goofing off, being teenagers, walking back from the pizza parlor. But he has to learn 
because it could be life or death. This is how you must behave. This is the way you have to conduct yourself. This is, you articulate, you speak, you do these things because you said, as you said, you have to almost plead with them. But now that they're seeing it um, with the George Floyd, uh, with the memorial services, things that are happening, we're requiring our children, I guess I could use the word require because they are teenagers, to sit down and we watch these funerals together. We listen to what's going on together. We, we watch all the history of Congressman John Lewis as a family because perhaps that will also have an impact on the way they see things. And it's not just something, oh, that's just mom or here goes dad again or grandma or grandpa. It is today's reality. And unfortunately, the exposure to it, I think, has just added to the fact that I'm not just that mom talk, talk, talking that, you know, you know, it's somebody's child, father who, who's not going to go home. But you can't just leave it out there. It has to be really close and have that conversation. And as Dr. Massey Lambert said, you know, give it language, make sure that there are outlets and that you're requiring some sort of expression and check in with emotions. So in some ways, the climate is very different because more people are engaged in it. But probably for most uh, people of color is not that radically different because we were primarily raised by people who were part of either the civil rights movement or their parents were part of the civil rights movement. So it hasn't been that long ago and it's always been very close. Um, you know, very close to how we operate. Thank you all. That that was some good dialogue, and you guys had me tearing up a little bit over here because the pain does run deep, um, and the anxiety of of watching our children, especially when they got their driver's license, and and having them just just be out there in, in the unknown um you know anybody who knows me i'm known as the helicopter mom and you know some people say i'm i'm a little bit too much but it's just how how i feel and 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 it's something that i don't know if i will ever get over um with with any of them and the conversations that we have had to have um even with travis who just turned 11 um, it's heartbreaking. And when we had the first um, protest in Burlington Township, it, it broke my heart to see, I'm, I'm saying, wow, it's 2020. Why is it that my son has to go out there to participate in this? This should not be his experience, but it is. Um, so the next thing that, that we need to, to talk about is, is how can we as parents move forward? How can we help our community? And even though, you know, a small Burlington Township, it, it, it expands and what we do here hopefully will, um, will, will, will take light and, and go into other communities. But how do we foster these, these conversations? How do we nourish them? How do we move forward? so that this does not go away and we see some true change so that history does not repeat itself. Um, so I think one of the things, I think one of the places we start is really with our friends, um, you know, and, and really sort of, you know, if you're, if you have a, a social circle that is not diverse, that you know, you know, you can't really point to somebody who is culturally or racially or ethnically, you know, different from you. You know, that might be an area for you to, for you to work on um, because your children will do what you do. And so, you know, for us, um, you know, with my kids, it was really important to me that they just that they just, you know, we moved. One of the reasons why we moved to Burlington Township was because of its diversity. So then to move here because it was so diverse, but then to not really tap into that diversity socially, I think we really would have been 
kind of shortchanging ourselves. And so, you know, really sort of talking, you know, teaching our children um, and really talking to them and encouraging them to, you know, not only for them to have sort of a diverse, you know, social circle, but also for us too. They needed to see that, you know, with, with us too. Because if I wasn't friends with, you know, um, you know, white or Latino or Indian or, you know, I, I, I would be missing out myself. And so I think that really is kind of a really good place to start. It's hard to sort of mend and heal with people that you don't know. And so, you know, if you, I think that, I think that's kind of like, that's really been my, or our, um, one of our values really is for all of us to really sort of just expand that circle so that, you know, you might be comfortable with somebody who, you know, looks like you or has a, you know, you share, you know, the same culture. But I think the other piece of that is, you know, you can become comfortable with somebody who initially does not sort of, you know, present the way that you do. And so, you know, I, I would just really encourage, you know, all of us really to just, because I think, you know, uh, we had a, a pre-meeting and I think it was, you um, the Millers that said, we all need to just sit down and, you know, I really am be, I'll be happy when we're all in the same room. And I, I'm so feeling that I really do agree with that because I think that that's really just a part of, you know, just meeting new people and, and extending yourself. I think that's the, I think that's the first step. And I think with that, just to add, and, and doing that without necessarily forsaking your own culture, you know, I think sometimes people try to assimilate or, or blend in and they lose a part of themselves to make the other people group feel comfortable. And I think we need to be comfortable being ourselves and celebrating our differences instead of trying to mask them. And I, if I can jump in here, I would say when there are opportunities as families um, really to take the time to slow down and capitalize on an opportunity because we're all busy, you know, it's the daily grind, moving through time and through space, but don't leave it up to the school, don't leave it up to the church, don't leave it up to the grandparents. Make sure that you have the support from all of those units and organizations, but at the same time, you know, the responsibility as a parent is the ultimate responsibility. So back when Kaepernick took a knee, it wasn't addressed in school. It was um, a missed opportunity from my perspective. So have that conversation and also as a parent allow, I know I have to present things in a way that will allow my children to speak in their truth and not to I'll give them, you know, my perspective and some context and allow them to talk and, you know, kind of quiet down for a minute and then go back to it, um, as I said, over and over again, because, um, you know, ultimately as parents, we want to make sure that everything that's going on, you know, we don't hear the great things that are happening as much. So we don't want our children to be in a situation where something negative is happening and it really, really hits too close to home. And then that's what jolts them into the reality. So, you know, if the school isn't doing it, um, you know, also advocate within the school. As I said, I sent an email. Um, I would like to be a part, raise your hand, no matter what our schedules are, just find the time um, to find an entrance into how can we have these conversations both within the nuclear home and then within the surrounding community. Can I comment, Liz? Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that it, it would be helpful if caregivers are um, really mindful of their own biases and also their own trauma responses. We all know that our children are always listening and always watching. And if we have any biases that we're, you know, not keeping in check, they're going to pick up on that. They're going to learn that, and then it becomes their own also. Um, and then just being aware of your trauma responses is really important because um, there's a there's a transmission of um, traumatic responses from one generation to the next um, if we're not careful. Um, I grew up with a grandfather who grew up during Jim Crow, and he, you know, was a successful, healthy-appearing man on the outside, um, but in his home, he boarded up the front door, 
with several locks and talked about, you know, I couldn't go in anyone else's front door, so no one's going in mine. So kind of growing up with those images, you know, you're sharing the trauma you know, from one generation to the next. So, you know, you, you can you can certainly unintentionally um, share that anxiety and that pain if we're not aware of what we're dealing with and, and deal with our stuff. Thank you, Shanique. Someone um, responded to um, something that, that was said and, and they said we should not mask ourselves and it resonated with um, someone saying it's important that we speak our truth, which is definitely something that, that we have to do. Any of other panelists want to, to weigh in? Miller as well. Go for it. So I, I'd like to just, uh, bring up one thing that kind of resonates with me and uh, the fact that there are, I think, inherent roadblocks, just, just as part of our human nature, to fostering some of these discussions. And, you know, one thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, we don't see color, right? That, that's something that comes to mind because I've, I've been around kids in, in different cultures and I've been a coach for over a decade in the township and I feel like I always treated people the same and, and never kind of brought that that uh, perspective or I don't, I don't even want to say bias into it. But the, the fact of the matter is everyone sees color and it's part of it's part of our human reality. Right. But it's not a bad thing. Like Ed said, it's something that needs to be recognized and celebrated for what it is. And um, and we have to adjust to who we're not be different, not put the mask on. But we have to um, respect who, like the doctor just said about her grandpa. I couldn't imagine my grandpa going through what her grandpa. So I respect that. I'm sorry. I well, it in. Well, yeah, what I was going to say is that uh, when I was a coach, we started a character development program. And every, sorry if you hear some weird noises, it's our dogs fighting in the background. Um, we started a character development program. Every week we would do a different lesson. Um, like selflessness, uh, perseverance, sportsmanship. And each week we would give out a gold block to somebody that, that demonstrated that particular um, characteristic. And, it, and, you know, it kind of aligns with uh, what the doctor said with elementary school and the praise and, and upstander behavior. But now I look back at it and, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have thought about bringing in something like equality or bias. To, to foster that discussion. So I think it's, I think we have turned a corner. I really feel that way, um, that it's it's much more at the forefront. People are getting more comfortable having these discussions and bringing it out, uh, you know, in their communities and their families. Someone just typed in the chat, we are all beautiful, which is so, so true. Anyone else? So Liz, I will again, I'm sorry. I just want to tell a story about my girl. This must have happened for a reason. My girlfriend, she had an incident on Facebook where she was talking about the little white boy who just got shot by the 24, 25 year old black man. And on her post, she put, where is the peaceful protester? I believe his name is Connor, the little boy. Where is the peaceful, peaceful protest for Connor? Um, where's, you know, all the outrage? And somebody went in on her because she said all lives matter. And she texts me on the side and she said, Bobby Joe, can you, can you look at my post and see what I did wrong? So I read her post and I said, I'm going to tell you what you did wrong because we can't judge each other on how we feel. If I feel some way, you can't get mad at me for that. I'd rather you educate me on that instead of getting mad at me. But I told her, you have to understand about the all lives matter, the blue lives matter. All lives cannot matter if black lives don't matter. And she did not, she didn't get it at first. And then I told her my story about my conversation with my boys going out the door and a black mom's conversation with her boys going out the door is completely different. And she completely got it. And I said, 
And she got it after 15 minutes of talking to her and educating her. I said, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. So true. And again, I, I keep saying that this time things feel so different. And I think they feel different because people are paying attention. Um, you know, COVID happened for a reason and it slowed all of us down. And people had no choice but to pay attention to what's happening. Um, there was no other outlet. There was nothing else to focus on except for what was right there in our faces. So, um, you know, I think it's it's very important that um, we continue to have these types of conversations and point out to people, you know, yeah, all lives do matter, but you have to understand it's, it's the black house that's on fire right now. You're not gonna put water on a house that's not burning. You're gonna put the water on the house that's on fire. And right now, the African American community is on fire. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, you know we were talking about how the, you know I think Liz, you just said that this feels different, and I think part of the difference is that you know um, I think you know at least as long as I've been alive. Um, you know, black people, and I'm going to say this is probably, you know, years and years ago as well, but we've all, we've always been saying, like you said, Liz, like the house is on fire. Like there's a problem. There is a problem. The house is on fire. Right. And so I think this time, you know, just like, um, you know, um, is, is Deb, right? Miller, Deb, what's her first name? I'm sorry. Just like Mrs. Miller said, <laughs> just like Mrs. Miller just said. You know, um, just kind of sharing that, that, you know, there it, it's not, I feel like it's not just us anymore. I mean, you know, so the issues with race is, is you know, in this country and, and racial injustice, it's not just a black problem anymore. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this idea that, you know, as a country, you know, there are other groups that are saying, okay, like, yeah. Okay, so we saw the smoke before, but I we actually see the flames. Like there is a problem, there is fire, and so to actually have you know um, those allies that say you know just like she said, like okay, here's the problem with that statement, because you know there was probably a time where you know that young woman probably wouldn't have asked like what's the problem. She probably would have said like. Well, I was just making a point. I don't know why everybody's so upset, but to actually have the presence of mind to ask, what is the problem with this? And then for her to go to somebody that did not, not only did Mrs. Miller not say, don't worry about it, just, just you know, those people are crazy, but to actually point out what the challenge here is, you know, and then for her to be reflective enough to, you know, internalize it and, you know, kind of correct that thinking. I think that's the difference. That's mm -hmm. to me is is like where this makes it this this makes it feel a little different or a lot different because I feel like for the first time it's not just black and brown faces, you know, um, sort of, you know you know, kind of waving the, you know, the, um, you know, the flag here. This is all of us, you know, saying like, there's a problem. And not only is there a problem, but now what we're going to do is work together so that it's not just a black problem. This is all of our problem. This is, this is an issue for all of us. And we're going to work together and, and, um, and make some changes. Absolutely. And, and again, it's not just us older folks. Um, and I'll put all of us in the older folks range, um, but it's our young people, our 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 teenagers, um, our our adolescents. They want to make a difference. They want to see change, and they are doing it in such a magnificent way. It just truly just it just touches me. Um, and you know, there we're setting up an, a time for, for the young ladies that organized the protest to have conversations with some of our textbook publishers to go to the root of, of some of the issues. They they were very honest and open with us and what, what we're doing. 
Um, you know, the conversations that we're having with the police department, um, and there's going to be a program next week that I'm going to, to share with everyone um, when we wrap up. But, you know, it's just um, what we're doing now, I think, speaks to the last question that we had talked about. And, and you guys have already started talking about that in terms of what's our hope for the future and, and how do we get there? And, and you're touching on that. You know, it's about us having allies. It's about us having advocates. It's about... Um, folks like Bobby Joe and Wade saying, hey, look, it's not just black and white. You got to see what else is going on in behind the scenes. So what what other thoughts are going through the minds of the panelists now? I think as we move forward, um, and I'm sort of teetering back and forth because young people being on the precipice of change isn't new. Uh, white people supporting black people as there have been unjust injustices isn't new. These are things that are cyclical and have happened, but I don't think the language and the intentional training and teaching necessarily took place, let's say 30 years ago or you know, 99 years ago. So I think um, as we continue to grow as um, within our culture and as we, you know, understand more things about psychology and cognition, having the conversation and naming things and it not just being the young people or the old people, the joining together of forces, I think is something that will hopefully make a difference. Um, the training that needs to take place, be it for the educators, be it for people in the, you know, in other service industries, um, police officers. Um, I think those are going to be, you know, now it's kind of moving to more of an anti-racist. I don't know if anybody's heard that term, but mm -hmm. you know, it's not okay to say I'm, you know as Wade said, you know, colorblind, and that's not really true, and it ignores every, you know, such a large part of who I am, um, and we all have the biases and things that are handed down to us or that we develop when we experience trauma, but, you know, what is it, what is this anti-racist movement? What is this upstander, you know, putting a name to things, calling it out, uh, reflecting for ourselves and making differences, and, you know, hopefully, I think moving into the future, these critical and difficult conversations will be something that changes. Um, we certainly, I think, have the, the power to do it. And social media, social media, excuse me, can be such a medium because we can really get maybe to a tipping point where it's, you know, everywhere. It's not just in New Jersey. It's not just, you know, in a particular state or on a particular content. But if COVID didn't teach us that we're all connected throughout this entire world, then I don't know what other kind of lesson we would need. So there, are, there's no single isolated places that exist. We are all one. It all impacts everyone. So if we begin to kind of put that together, um, hopefully, you know, the change will be sooner, um, and our children won't be going for as it seems to skip, our grandchildren won't be having these conversations um, in 30 years from now. Absolutely. Anyone else as we, we near the end of our time together? I'll just say, um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to say, I, I think it's important you know, what she just mentioned in terms of kind of making sure that we are facilitating conversations with our young people and partnering with them to allow them to express themselves. Then it's funny, I had a conversation with my daughter, uh, one of my daughters when this first started, and she just felt like there's something we need to do. We need to we need to be more intentional in our school and, and having these conversations. You know, so she and her friends kind of got together and they developed, you know, a proposal to start a black student union and they submitted it to the school. And you know, they're 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 trying to be they try to do things not so much to be like rabble rousers as much as you need to have some like we're having this conversation right now students need to be having these conversations amongst themselves so that they can start understanding each other better and interacting better and so 
you know, and so fine. So I think we we just need to find different ways um, socially and institutionally to kind of get involved and start being intentional about identifying some of the things that we see that perpetuate some of these um, some of these issues and then working to dismantle them and replace them with things that we know will work better. So I think mm-hmm. um, for us as parents, we need to encourage our kids to kind of, you know, protesting is great, it's good, it draws awareness, but then what's the next step? What can we do um, institutionally? What can we do, you know, systemically to start changing some of the things that um, um, are causing some of these issues or promoting some things that will kind of change the dialogue and change the tone and change the atmosphere? We have some folks chiming in um, on the chat um, saying that uh, uh, the Millers and other neighbors of varying shades, white, brown, black, et cetera, it's critical to for- forging relationships to build our community. Um, Dana, someone said your point is perfect. It's, it's dead on. Um, one of our teachers said that she agrees a billion percent keeping the conversations open and the term that resonated with her was intentional, which is exactly what um, you all are doing. And it's no mistake that um, you know we reached out to the panel that we have because um, we know we knew what what you could bring to the table. And I just want to thank all of you um, for joining us in this journey. And it is a journey, and something we will continue to do. Um, for everyone who is listening to us, you will be getting a survey um, that will be coming from, from Kim Hayes. And we want feedback on this session. We wanna know what else you want to um, hear. Again, we're gonna keep these conversations going. This, Look, I have about 20 more years to work at the rate I'm going. We're gonna keep talking, we're gonna keep it moving. Um, but the next session is gonna be happening in September, towards the end of September. And it's about equity and education. What does that really mean? Um, and the the big item that I want to give everybody for homework is I'm hoping that we can get people to sign up for our small group interactive trainings where you are really going to have to step out of your comfort zone and do a lot of self-reflecting and engage with people, probably strangers, maybe some people you know, but the trainings will definitely take you to a whole other level of understanding and understanding what it is to walk in someone else's shoes and see other perspectives. So that's going to be coming. Um, I'm pleased to announce, and we do have representatives from the police department um, who are with us here tonight um, listening in, but next week, the Burlington Township Police Department um, is holding the social justice town hall. It's a virtual town hall next Thursday, the 27th at six o'clock. Um, I'm going to be sending out information um, with them. Um, and basically the first session is entitled Integrity, Service and Respect, Building Police Community Trust in Burlington Township. So um, as we close out tonight, <laughs> Again, I want to thank all of our panelists for your your openness. I want to thank you for participating and stepping outside of your comfort zone. I know some of you um, were kind of giving me the side eye when when I asked, and uh, your some spouses said, "Wow, we've been married all this time, and uh, wow, they really stepped out." So I, I just really appreciate it, Shanique. You were phenomenal. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you so much. We're giving you the the clap clap there. Um, we just truly appreciate your partnership with Burlington Township. When we first started this venture of of uh, trauma, who knew we would be going down this pathway? But it all is tying in together, and I'm looking forward to um, continuing our partnership um, to better our community and, and take take us to the next level. So, um, Shanique or Kelly, either one of you want to have the the closing word? Thank you to Rutgers for letting us use the the WebEx. Um, really love this. So, thank you. But I want to give give uh, give you ladies the final word. Okay, Um, I would just say continue to have courageous conversations, even when they're uncomfortable, because there's so much value in that. Um, And we grow in discomfort, 
And also, if we're looking to make real change, let's focus on impact and not intention. Um, often we have the best of intentions, but we're still seeing people really hurt and impacted. So let's focus on who's impacted and how they're impacted and restructure things to address that. Thank you. Kelly, are you good? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I am Shanique's colleague at Rutgers and also a resident of Burlington Township, raising three boys here that are making a little noise in the background. Um, but it's an honor to work with the town in this in, in this capacity, as well as being a resident here. And I'm so encouraged by everything I'm hearing and learning. And again, I just want to echo what um, Liz said in the beginning. If it's feeling uncomfortable, that means you're doing it right. So lean into that and keep going. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Um, this conversation. And we are going to, we did record it, so we will be able to play it again for you. So have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your your late dinners, and uh, be safe and stay well. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.